No. So once once this became a real big issue, there has not been a flight since. I think we did a press conference at one of the other, I think at Cecil. So how many weeks has it been? I mean, it's been six weeks. Yeah, at least six weeks where there's not been any flights. And so we're happy with that. We obviously don't want to uh, continue to see flights uh, uh, coming in. And again, if you had the other policy, there'd be you know, no need to do any flights anywhere. And so we hope that that's the, the, the direction they're going. But, yeah, no flights over at least the last six weeks. Well, and then on that, um, we were talking about the sanctions and the slow that were involved with these companies and all that. Can you give us any idea of the companies that you're talking about? Are we talking about the charter flights? Or so, we, yeah, so, so there's, there's a number. There's a list of a bunch of charter companies uh, that have been involved. Um, and then I, there's also ground transportation. That's a little bit uh, more difficult to, to get your finger on sometimes because there are normal buses that come and go anyways. It's not like every bus, but these flights in the middle of the night, you know. So, so those types of contractors, uh, they're just going to be on notice that once you do the federal government and you're facilitating illegal migration and you're imposing burdens on Florida, uh, you're forfeiting your right to have any relationship with state or local governments. And then, of course, we are going to do the restitution as well. And so I hope people will just look at that and say, you know what, that, 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 ain't, that ain't worth it. I'd much rather uh, be able to do business in Florida normally than to participate in something that's highly controversial. Obviously, it's something that's had devastating consequences to this community. And unfortunately, we'll, we'll, we'll likely continue to see those if these policies don't change. Yes, sir. In the case of the man who's arrested for the murder of Francisco Cuellar, I think I heard it that he was definitely on one of those flights. Yes. So he was. So he had posed as a minor. So the flight had minors, and you know these flights. There, there's, there's a difference. Sometimes you'll have like you know, relatively young kids on these flights. And then sometimes you'll have a lot of people who, you know, when I was in, when I was serving in Iraq, we consider like a 16 or 17 year old Iraqi to be a military age male. And so they're technically minors um, in that respect, but you have people that are more, um, you know, advanced. And so he posed as a 17 year old, was able to get on the flight, was obviously released, uh, you know, locally, and then, and then committed the murder. So it was illegal entry, but then also fraud in terms of saying you this. But it goes back to the point of what Sheriff Williams was saying. You don't know who any of these folks are. There's no documentation. You don't necessarily know what country. Now, sometimes, like I was down in Del Rio, you could see, I mean, there's obviously a difference between someone coming from Guatemala or someone coming from Haiti. You can kind of figure, figure that out. But um, at the end of the day, you don't know. And you also have folks who have been in other countries so maybe they're from one country, they left, they've been living in another country for years, but then they say, hey, you can come across the border, so now they're deciding to come to the United States. I'll tell you, though, it's, it has destabilized some of these communities um, in different parts of, of Central America in particular, and you know, my view would be, you know, they're, they're, if, if, if they knew that this wasn't viable, much more likely to, to work and, and do things to help their own communities there. But when you're told, hey, just come across the border and you're fine, you know, some people are doing that. It is, though, very hazardous. So there's a whole host of, of people coming across. But when you have a flight, you know, to have very young children, you have people that are six, seven, eight years old. That is hazardous that they would be going across the entire Central America, all into Mexico. It is, as, as Larry said, this is not working out well. I mean, just think, like, I mean, as a father of young kids, I don't want my kids out of my sight. I would never allow something like that to happen. But you got a lot of bad things going on. The cartels are taking advantage of it. There's human smuggling. And uh, it's just a really bad situation. So for us to be, as a country, basically facilitating that, that's a really, really bad policy. It is very hazardous to have somebody who's that young uh, being illegally crossing international borders. That is just not a policy uh, that, that we should want to entertain at all. In the six weeks since the flight stopped coming in to Jacksonville, have you seen any change in cooperation between the flight administration and your office? And in totality, does your office have any sense of how many individuals have been brought to the country? So we, um, we don't have a sense overall. Now, we do know the certain number of flights here. We have a rough estimate about how many people would have been on the flights. So what has happened since? They have changed the policy, and when we're litigating against them, from notice to uh, report to notice to appear, 
and, and that's a very positive movement. Now, they're fighting us on providing documentation in that case. And our view is, is you know, we want to know why you're making these decisions because this goes into, like, administrative law and all this other stuff. And they've been very, very difficult, would you say, in terms of not providing anything in terms of that type of cooperation. And so, in some respects, it's a litigation strategy because what they're going to say is, well, we don't even really even have a policy, so how could the state you know, be, be suing us on it? So I think they're trying to do a little end run. We hope the court doesn't accept that because that would create some bad incentives. So we're at loggerheads on that case, and uh, I think we'll continue to be. They, they, they're trying to get it dismissed. They did make the important concession, but I think ultimately push is going to have to come to shove on that. I do think having an adverse ruling, which they've already had for uh, Remain in Mexico, you know, that's very, very important because that's a key to really shut off a lot of what we've seen in terms of the illegal migration uh, across the southern border into Texas. So hopefully we will get more positive results in our lawsuit and then we can see. But my sense is there's not going to be voluntary reappraisals of what they're doing. If they feel that they may be vulnerable legally, then I think they'd be more interested in maybe doing something. But I don't think it's going to be because all of a sudden they've had an epiphany and say, you know what, our policy hasn't worked. I mean, I think, as John said, yes, I mean, look, there is incompetence involved because when you have people on a runway for 10, 10 hours sitting there, that's not good. But, but a lot of it is intentional, and so you have what you have. So hopefully we'll win our case. These reforms hopefully will protect uh, Florida will disincentivize uh, folks from wanting to facilitate uh, these policies, and I think everybody will be better off um, as a result. Okay, thanks so much. Great to be here.